right. And we are live. JT here. Welcome to the huddle. The huddle is where I sit down with successful people from the world of sport and coaching. It's to learn more about their journey to greatness. Why do I have these conversations? Because success always leaves clues. I want to thank you. Whether you are joining us live as we stream into our Facebook community, whether you are watching the replay on YouTube or on Facebook, or whether you're listening to the audio on the podcast, thank you so much for being here with me and my special guest today. And here's my friendly reminder to you. The mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's wide open. My challenge to you is to go all in, to open up your mind. And what I guarantee you is you will gain a valuable nugget of wisdom that will not only help you succeed in sports, but in the game of life. I've been looking forward to my conversation with my special guest today. You know, we, we've had a couple conversations and uh, I, I was just mentioning to him before we came live, I, I feel like this conversation could go on for a little bit, we'll say, um, but you know, we'll, we'll really do our best to, um, <laughs> to keep you to an hour today. My guest in the huddle today is the athletic director at uh, Lowry University, and he's just really got some interesting ideas. He's, he's, he's going on to a new adventure in his life, so, so I really wanted to bring him on so he could share some of his wisdom. My guest in the huddle today is Peter Baxter. How are you today, brother? Really good. Thanks very much, JT, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, definitely. So one thing I want to acknowledge you for is, you know, I'm a firm believer that it's important to always count your blessings. And I know for me, that's a daily practice. It's something that I remind myself often. And, and I believe that our time and energy is the greatest resource we can share with anyone. So thank you so much again for, for being able to share some of your time and energy into being here with me and our community today, Peter. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And I've listened to your podcast and you certainly have a lot of energy, Jason. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is one thing for sure. Sometimes it's, it's just harnessing it and focusing it, as, as my wife says. <laughs> so, Peter, I, I'm curious. You know, I, one thing I always like to remind people is that life is a game and games are supposed to be fun. So I'm curious, what is an interesting fact? I had a coaching colleague that once said, hey, we all have our quirks. We all have our things that maybe a lot of people don't know about you that you would be open to sharing with our community. Yeah, uh, you know, first of all, uh, thank you very much for bringing me on to the, the podcast. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, there's been, been some excellent guests that's uh, been on it. But, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of quirks with me. Uh, I think we're, we're all a little dysfunctional in some ways or have our quirks. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, you could probably get some good things. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I sort of joke with my staff sometimes that uh, when I retire, uh, I might write a book, you know, uh, dumb things the athletic director said. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I also, uh, uh, you know, I would say that one of the things that's a little bit different um, that I came and I've had, you know, good mentors over a period of time over uh, over my career is uh, when I came into uh, being an athletic director in the in U sports uh, back then it was the CIAU then it was CIS and now U sports um, was that uh, I came from a different background more from um, sport management side entrepreneurial side facility building side whereas every athletic director in the country was from the coaching component part. Now mm -hmm. I did coach uh, at, a, at a different level, uh, both football and hockey uh, uh, 
you know, previous to coming to Laurier, uh, when I was an athletic director at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. But, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I came from a more recreation background into, into sport. But um, it doesn't really matter uh, what part of the continuum that you're on from open recreation, intramurals, instructional programming, meditative arts, dance, to high performance sport. Um, you, you know, it's still dealing with people at, at, at their level. And so, uh, you know, one of the, the mantras that I've learned over that years has been invest in people, improve the person and win. And winning is defined more than just scoreboard success. It's defined about uh, building the person holistically in, in all, all the areas. And a lot of your, your guests and podcasts have shared that wisdom. And uh, so um, I came from a, a, a bit of a different background. And uh, some people wouldn't, wouldn't see the, the regular pass, but I think that uh, that's something I share too with a lot of up and coming uh, young people who want to aspire to uh, become an athletic director down the road. Mm -hmm. I love that, Peter. And, and I appreciate you sharing. Uh, one, it's a simple reminder. Um, what I love is how you chose to focus on what comes first, the investing in people spot. So, so I'm curious, like you said, you come from a diverse background, right? Like you, you have been a servant-based leader at many different levels, right? Recreation, you know, OFSA, university, OUA level. So I'm curious, what has been the biggest lesson that you've taken from sport that really you apply today? So I know you mentioned investing in people. Was there a particular mentor you know, uh, that, that taught you that idea? Yeah, I had, had a number of, of really uh, good mentors. Uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Toronto, so I had people like uh, Bruce Kidd, uh, who taught about uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of even uh, democracy in sport, that, like, you know, a certain group want to engage in a certain activity, you should be able to find a way in which they can do that. Um, you know, I remember when I was uh, athletic director at uh, University of Toronto, there was a debate about whether Toronto would keep football or not. And, you know, I use that is that, you know, football is a sport and, and uh, that uh, engages young people at different shapes and size and now even women and, uh, and they wouldn't be able to play a team sport anywhere else because they're just genetically large um and uh uh you know there and there's nothing better in the in the sport of football than the uh the team environment that comes along with it the camaraderie so you know um uh, uh certainly the, back then but i would say that one of my my key mentors was at offsa uh andy gibson who uh, was the executive director at the time he um he you know he saw sport as a platform for, for education. You educated through sport, and that was really the motto of, of OFSA, education through school sport. And when you think about it, you know, you, you, um, you have, oh, at the time, there might be more now, uh, but there was about 10 to 12,000 teacher coaches. Think about that as a social service network, because, you know, and a support group that uh, engage one on one with young people, young young girls, young boys, and in some cases, they're you know they depending on their social economic status, their family situation, they were role models for them and gave them a leg up, gave them some confidence in life, some life skills, and so forth. So I always admired the work of uh, teacher coaches uh, across this province, you know, in every high school and, and what kind of impact that did, that did in terms of positivity that was there. So, um, you know, I learned very early that, um, that, that sport is, is not within its, its own realm. In fact, Andy 
um, he would only have two subscriptions in the office and none of them were sport. Yeah. And you know what they were? The Economist, because business trends, uh, science trends, uh, political trends, all have an impact on sport. You can't live with, without it. So you have to learn about that. The second thing was the World Future Society. And what that did was give what new innovations in, in science and technology, but make sure that you think about it in terms of how it applies, uh, how you can impact that to sport. You know, think about computers. Back in those days, I would run a Gestetner machine with, uh, <laughs> with um, uh, the uh, registration forms for off the track, 2,000 participants out to 600 high schools. They'd have to come back. We'd have to put it in one computer and put in all the, the entries in so that you could get the timing system all done. Mm -hmm. um, but you think of how, you, how somebody's a lot smarter than me has applied technology to create what we have today, where you know, once you sign up for a road race, which I just did uh, a few weeks ago, yeah. the, the chip was there and you, you had your timing. Yeah. So um, you, know, you, you have to kind of look at the next future um, uh, trend and how, you, how do you plot, apply that to sport? Hmm. I love what you're sharing. And, and it was interesting, like what I really heard from you was, you know, sport can be a wonderful vehicle to, to educate, right? To really teach these greater life lessons. And, and I know from your experience at Offset, you know, coming from a background as a high school educator, I know how foundational, right? The, you know, the football field, the basketball court, you know, the soccer field, the ring can be. Right. And it's interesting that as you were sharing, I realized that some of the most fulfilling experiences of my career were by investing in people, right. And building that, that trust, building that connection. Um, one thing I just wanted to acknowledge you for there, Peter, was how your idea about investing in people first is very evident. You know, I think of the other conversations I've had from other Laurier alum, whether it's Coach Falls whether it's uh, Kweku Boateng, whether it's Liana Ose, they, they embody those lessons. So, so I just really want to take a moment to acknowledge you because I ha have no doubt that those lessons were ones that they, they got from you. So that's awesome. Well, you know, that's what it's all about, serving others. You know, uh, you know you, you, what just came to mind too is that all those teacher coaches as well as coaches at universities and how they impact that, that only enhances what they have in the classroom, especially teacher coaches. If you're a science teacher and you're, you're coaching volleyball or basketball or hockey or whatnot, you interact with that student at a different level, that enhances their intention in the, in the classroom and makes them a better teacher on that side. So that's like, I got to give credit to the investment that a teacher coach in this province, in this country does uh, in, uh, in high school sport uh, or, and, and, or any co-curricular activity. Like um, if you look at all the schools that have really flourished at a very high level, like, and there's research, especially in the United States on high school education, the, the schools that have flourished have had a very strong uh, sport program but also a music program, maybe a glee club uh, or a camera club or whatnot, where teachers are interacting at a different level than just in front of the blackboard in, in a classroom situation. It only enhances the, the total outcome on that side. Yeah, definitely. And I've definitely seen that from my lived experience. Uh, the other thing sort of picking back off what you talked about is high school sport, you know, just from a, is, is inclusive. Right. It's diverse. It's equitable, typically because uh, many of the costs like renting facilities are embedded within. Right. They're already picked up. So I, I do believe that that's the power of, of high school and, and community sport. So I'm curious, Peter, again, you're you're embarking on your next adventure. 
right? As, as transitioning to the next phase of your life. So I'm curious from your perspective, you know, we're coming out of an interesting time, right? The last two years have, have been interesting for all of us, right? We all, we've all had a different experience. From your experience, your expertise, your wisdom, what do you think needs to happen at all levels of sport to ensure that we come out of this stronger, more powerful and, and building, you know, um, I don't know, just maybe a, a better model moving forward and getting more people engaged? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, you know, history does repeat itself. And um, if you look in the, the Spanish flu time uh, of, uh, um, you know, the uh, 1918 and, and beyond, sport was a big part of coming back to normalcy. People wanted to engage in sport. We're seeing a little bit with even at 50% capacity right now that people want to get back engaged in watching sport as fans, but also in, in, uh, in participation of sport. So I think that um, uh, we had a bit of a taste of it in the fall, you know, uh, you know when uh, uh, we had the fall, a very successful fall season. And the energy um, level of the of the student athletes um, it was because they're they're now interacting with people with the motor neurons talking. You feed off their energy. I felt it just going to a game with the event staff. You know, like the the student leaders that are are running it. That you know you have that. So I think you know in the go forward we have to be you know, cautious, there's going to be uh, some challenges financially on, on some of the institutions in terms of how we kind of grow back to the new norm. But, um, you know, I think we've learned some lessons and there's been some positive things that have come up. Um, uh, you know, the technology switch, uh, be able to uh, uh, recruiting uh, you know, uh, virtually, you know, you still want to uh, go visit uh, uh, student athletes and so forth. But even the teaching component part, uh, the technology on film work, uh, the ability for um, uh, student athletes to learn on that side. We've done some education programs on uh, educational models. Um, you know, even a lot of the things you mentioned about EDI and uh, um you know, we've been able to use modules to uh, educate rather than the logistics of having everybody in a lecture room that we can have experts from across the world talk about it and especially your alumni to engage their wisdom uh, with, with, uh, with student athletes to give them support and learning on, uh, you know, in indigeneity on, uh, BIPOC, uh, 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 component parts. So we've made some, some, um, some great gains so that, uh, when we come back to in person, uh, that we can use what we've learned that's enhanced the experience, uh, during COVID which we had no choice, but that was the only enhancement. Mm -hmm. Keep it uh, as we move forward. You know, it's interesting, like as you were sharing there, I, I thought about, you know, what, what's the, what was the theme I really heard there? And what I really heard from you is, you know, creating those opportunities to, to create a greater sense of community, whether it's engaging people with specialized knowledge, right? Like you gave the example of the EDI space, whether it's engaging alumni, right? So that, you know, there's, it's almost like you're sort of building this, this hope, right? Of what could be, right? What's possible. And I just think of that idea of like leveraging tech to, to really bring our world closer and to sharing. It's, it's almost to me, this evolution of, you know, this quote unquote old way of doing things like, like that's how we taught, you know, in previous generations, right? Was through story was from elders passing down these lessons to the younger parts of the community. So it's almost interesting to me how it's coming full circle in some of these well, practices. You know, and the proof is, and I give Michael Foles credit and, and his staff, 
we've really engaged our alumni, um, uh, uh, you know, through our town halls with our st student athletes. Then the student athletes build a relationship with them. And some of them have been able to network in terms of their next step after their career, their sport career is over into, you know, if their interest is in business, if their interest is in sport management and so forth, they actually have a connection uh, that that moves them forward in, in life. And, um, you know, sport will will your sporting career will end. There's a finite component part. Uh, but you, you need to take those lessons, but you also need um, to be able to ask questions by people who have been through it. I always say to my staff who want to be athletic directors, there's people here, you know, KP and Ann, there's Ryan Lannon, um, uh, Janelle Herbert. Uh, they all would like to and someday have the opportunity, which I've been privileged to have for 31 years at two institutions. Um, uh, you know, they, they, uh, you know, you, you have to, um, be able to have, uh, learn. I always say, learn from my mistakes, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I've made a lot of them, <laughs> but you know, mistakes, just a learning opportunity yeah. that you have, you'll get through it, you know, on there. And, anything worthwhile any team that we've won our 2005 team went through some unbelievable adversity and obstacles in in winning that championship and i'm sure every other team across the oua that has been successful has gone through some kind of adversity or made mistakes along the way but that is part of it part of the process and uh, nothing comes easy you have to have patience. You have to understand that there's going to be obstacles in the way, but you find the path. And just like water, water goes around the boulder and uh, yeah. eventually ends out down the river uh, into the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, and what I love from what you're sharing, Peter, is it's just, it's, it's so, it really is simple, right? And, and sometimes, you know, I, I think we've been sort of programmed to live to complicate things right and that's kind of the fun thing about humans it's it's just understanding that uh, what i love that you shared is one of the favorite one of my favorite quotes to live by that i often remind myself to daily practice like you said ebbs and flows is the nelson mandela quote like i never lose i either win or i learn and i find whenever i challenge myself just to look at okay what can i learn you know what you know what what can i win and i know i just flipped it there but that it, 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 it allows life to feel lighter. And I think when you sort of reframe it there, it sort of allows you just to, I don't know, maybe look at the lighter side of life as cliche as that is. And it just allows you then to create a path moving forward, right? Because I think at least from, again, my lived experience, sometimes, you know, when you make things hard and, and do all that, it, it keeps you stuck. Uh, well, when you think about it, you know, uh, like I, I just remember, 2004, um, the uh, uh, UTEC Bowl at Laval, we were handed it, <laughs> you know, our team. I remember um, a lot of the guys on the field say, okay, we know wh where we have to go. We got to get back in the weight room. They were still on the field after a devastating loss and they had to do it. And then the next year they ran the table on it. You know, a lot of times, and a lot of people have said, Sometimes you don't learn a lot by just winning <laughs> easy, yeah. right? And the toughest thing is when you're successful is to keep the mindset to repeat. Mm -hmm. You know, that is very, very difficult. And uh, um, not uh, because you have the tendency when you're to sort of let yourself down a bit, mm -hmm. take the foot off the gas mm -hmm. and, uh uh, that's a difficult uh, uh, challenge. Yeah, no, definitely. So, so I'm curious, again, you're very passionate about health and wellness, right? Like you were mentioning there that, you know, you're someone who, who really celebrates sport wellness. You know, I find one thing that I'm really curious about is coming out of this, I feel that one of the challenges we're facing is 
you know, mental health, right? Wellness overall. So, so I'm curious from your perspective, someone who's passionate, someone who's a leader in that space, you know, what can we do to best support our athletes and coaches as we transition out of this time? Because as we were saying earlier, this, this last two years has been challenging for, for, for all of us at some point. Right. So I'm curious, like, um, yeah, you know, it, you know uh, one of the things is, is you really have to connect the mind with the body. They're, they're, they're not separate items. So like a lot of, uh, hey, I, I, I took a course at uh, Western in my master's at the time uh, Jack Ferris had and, and Angie Schneider, who's the current uh, philosophy professor there. It was just her and I in the class. Um, and uh, um, she, you know, uh, you learn that, in, in, in Western philosophy, um, there was Plato and Aristotle, and you see this famous painting by Raphael, and I, I still have it, and it's the school of Athens, and Plato's pointing up what is truth, it's the mind, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. and there's uh, Aristotle pointing downwards, you know, it's what's known to us, the physical, but the reality is it's intertwined. You have actually, um, uh, part of your brain is in your gut. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there, it, it works together. It doesn't work uh, uh, just on the mind side of things. And for, um, so, you know, I think that the training of meditation is really, really important. Mm -hmm. To sometimes not think is important. Uh, to uh, be in stillness, to, to actually observe nature and see how you're connected with it that's there. The problem is, is this right now. On average, in a book uh, called The Coddling of the American Mind, yeah. six hours, six hours on the phone. And sometimes without a lot of breaks. So, you know, you, it's not, it's a great tool. And I'm not saying you, you take that away, but you have to have everything in moderation. So it comes back to, um, you know, some of the uh, philosophy of Stoics that uh, talks about, you know, what wisdom, justice, moderation, or temperance. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I think that uh, if you look at some of the successful teams like the Chicago Bulls, uh, uh, the Lakers, um, the uh, uh, the Warriors, they they all had uh, used meditation as part of their their regular regime, and meditation has to be like going into the weight room every day, um, or, or into the gym to to shoot baskets. It's got to be part of your your regimen because it gives you uh space when you have space in your mind uh you're able to create and uh, and that um i'm also taking right now there's a book called uh, designing um uh, the mind it's by ryan bush and he's actually a software person he, he talks about uh how to deal with anxiety and uh fear and worry through an algorithm <laughs> you know, okay. and how, how it works. And, you know, you have, a, you know, a, a stressor, you know, it could be a big competition, it could be uh, something that you fear. And that creates an arousal. And you gotta, you gotta, when you have an arousal, you have a body experience that's there. Yeah. So you have to, if you focus in on the body, that actually opens up the mind a bit to mm -hmm. allow it. Then you appraise it. You're able to appraise it at a distance, not on an emotional level, because if you want your 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 flight might make you say, "I'm going to avoid it," but that only brings you back to arousal again at a certain point. What you have to do is have that space, have an appraisal, say, "How much is that competition or what I have to do really going to affect me?" down the road and you address it and then you take action you have to take action towards it 
And, uh, uh, but anyways, uh, there's much more uh, to the book, but I really uh, believe that um, uh, we have to train uh, student athletes how to deal with that arousal as part of a mind body uh, uh, sense, be, be sensitive to it. Because once you are aware of the physical sensation that gives space to the mind and doesn't allow the emotion to trigger, um, uh, you know, some of the, uh, um, and sometimes actions that you would regret. Yeah. I love that Peter. And I, and I love how you, again, you have this beautiful gift of being able to, you know, use the law of polarity, right? Like being able to look at both sides of the coin. And, and what I really heard from you is, you know, this idea of technology, it, it's a, it's a tool, right? And, and I think back to this story I'll share with you. I used to have this when I was in education, you know, right near the end of my career, I could see this transition where technology was pre presenting a new challenge in the classroom, right? In the fitness, like it was really interesting. And I remember with a grade 11 fitness class, I had, you know, a lot of uh, athletes, high level athletes. And I said, Hey, listen, technology is a wonderful tool, but we just need to be aware who's the tool. Is it a tool for you? Or are you being the tool for technology, right? It's just kind of like a fun, playful way of doing it. Right. And there were times in the weight room where I said, I would encourage you to leave your phones in your bags and your lockers. Like this 45 minutes is for you. And, you know, there's some times where, you know, uh, my, the young men, the young athletes would come in and they'd look at the phone. And I said, who's the tool? And then they would kind of smile. And sometimes they'd be like, I'm being, I'm the tool. And then they put it away, right? Just those like reminders that, it, 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 and, and I found just making them more aware, it actually helped them start to make different decisions, right? And then again, it, it helped them become more focused in the weight room, which then allowed them to connect the mind and the body, which then allowed them to feel better. And, and as, right. as you were saying, it just, that's the starting point, right? Making them more aware. Yeah, the, the other thing too, that affects the body is language. You think about it in the team. You know, um, and you could see it in the body when people are negative in practice, uh, you know, in, in a game situation, uh, reacting to a play or whatnot. That affects the energy of everybody else on the team. And so language is something, too, that I think is really an important po uh, part of, of coaching young people to make sure that you understand that whatever you say has an effect on your peers um, and your teammates and what the collective can produce. So lang language is, an, is another one that I, I really highly recommend. You know, uh, Joe Ehrman, um, who uh, played for the Baltimore Colts um, in the uh, 70s and early 80s. Um, you know, he does a lot of workshops on masculinity, uh, anti-sexual violence, uh, um, you know, and he's, he's a high school coach too in, in, in there, but he, he really emphasizes how language can uh, really uh, affect uh, young people in a positive way if you use it in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. It's a simple reminder on, like you said, that's something I've become more aware of is, is the power of language, right? And, and how words can empower us or disempower us, right? Again, that law of polarity. Well, when you, when you, when you think of, of how divisive, you know, the politics are now, um, yeah. you know, how, how uh, and, and again, you know, we're not immune to it. Uh, sport does not live in a microcosm all by itself. Yeah. You know, you have to, uh, you're affected by everything that happens in, 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 uh, in society. So, you know, you, you, you have to, um, uh, uh, in this divisive side, that's why maybe an emphasis on, on how you treat other people mm -hmm. and language is part of that has to be, be made on the go forward, uh, coming back. 
You know, it, it's, I, I love what you're sharing, Peter. And one of the things, you know, through my work as, you know, as I currently serving as the director of sport football Ontario, you know, one thing we're really, one of the ideas I often share is like, be the change, right? It's easy to talk about change. Can you embody, can you demonstrate, can you actually be the change? And I know one thing we are really trying to do is like you were talking about the mindfulness, right? And, and we have this idea of, you know, how can we help our athletes, our, our coaches, right? To become, to feel happy, healthy, and well. Because I think at the end of the day, regardless of sport, that, that's what we all want, right? So, so I guess I'm curious with you is what is the easiest way to start to integrate that stuff? You know, th those concepts, because again, what I'm finding is we started to integrate that with our high performance program, right? With our team Ontario athletes. And I've actually found that our athletes are craving it. Like our young people, like when we do these sessions around mindfulness, you know, gratitude, you know, discovering inside, you can almost see this sense of peace come over them. Like they just, they want more of it. So I guess my, my question to you again, is being a leader in this space, what can we do to really help be the change to help really inspire more people to, to take some of these concepts around mindfulness, around stillness, around just being more. Well, you have to integrate it in the regular structure of the practice plan or annual planning of, of, of that. And it, it really is a daily thing. And, and part of it is there, there's misconceptions about mindfulness. You know, we use mindfulness. They, they you know, obviously they, they talk, they, a lot of people, and, and it, it, it's fine it, uh, on a religious side, you know, in Buddhism, uh, but realistically, uh, or prayer or, or so forth, but mindfulness is really breathing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and where does your energy come? Like, you know, you, you, you come from, from breathing, breathing is, uh, everybody has to do that but do we properly breathe and are we attentive to breathing and when you think about it when you're at a starting line or if you're about to uh, take the ball on a handoff before the play what do you do to calm yourself you breathe so that's what creates the focus and enhances the performance. So, you know, I, I am certified actually in mindfulness, sport, uh, performance enhancement. So it's part of um, uh, a, uh, uh, a program that's, that's off of what John Kabat-Zinn had for mindfulness stress, uh, um, which, you know, is, is utilized in, ho in hospitals for stress management, but also for cardiac pa patients and also addictions on that side. But, uh, you know, this is where the next level is. On a physical side, right, what's going to differentiate you now? I remember when I first came to, to Laurier, um, and even when, back in the day when, when, when I was uh, uh, at, at university, a lot of us would go to uh, training camp to get in shape. <laughs> 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 you know, we'd be working, but that's not how it, how it happened. So the physical component part was, was key. Strength and conditioning was the key. Um, you know, even when I came in at late nineties and so forth, but everybody's at the same level pretty much now. Yep. What's the difference that's going to take you? It's the mind. It's mm -hmm. the focus. That's what's going to take you to that. When you talk about greatness and or unlimited, unli unlimited potential, the mind opens that up. Some of the greatest performances has, has come in, in uh, areas uh, uh, where um, for some reason, the, the athlete has not seen any limitation. Think about uh, Roger Bannister in the four minute mile. Nobody could break that for years and years. When he broke it, within three months, 36 other people broke it. Why? Because a lot of people had the mindset nobody could do it. 
you know, right now the 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 two hour marathon, right, was a was a barrier, and um, you know, I, I you know somebody's just just broke it uh, on that that front. So you know, how far can the mind take you in terms of of where your mind body can go? Not just your body can go on that side. We thought of the the um, uh, for many years in, in science that, you know, that our body was just, a, you know, the vehicle, the, me the mechanism, the locomotive that could, could do it. And, the, and all the measurements was taken. And believe me, at, at Western, they, they would, back in the day, they would just poke after your, uh, your, your uh, uh, um, aerobic threshold test, they would just poke a muscle spasm in out of your thigh right away. Mm -hmm. I think there's more protocols on that, on yeah. that but that's how they <laughs> tested it to see you know what your lactic acid content was and so forth mm -hmm. but besides lactic I, 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 they were looking for limitations too yeah. like how far can your body go but what they found that if your mind is expanded you can actually go beyond where your 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 mind can go that, that's why I'm marathon running now. I read uh, David Goggins' book, The okay. Ultra Mar Marathoner. Yeah. Uh, and uh, during COVID, part of it was just his mental toughness uh, component part. But yeah. when you think about it, to run a marathon, a lot of people say that your body's not made for it. Well, if you train for it, and if you have the mindset that you can do it, why mm -hmm. not? I love what you're sharing. And obviously, you know, you talk about, you know, thinking and possibility, right? You know, truly being limitless. It's interesting. And what came up for me as you were sharing was this idea of we've been programmed and conditioned to believe that, you know, life is a zero sum game, right? That there's always one winner and one loser. And, you know, it's interesting. Again, it's not right or wrong. It just, that's just a belief. But it's interesting how, what really shifted for me in my life, and again, it's a daily practice, is, is learning that when someone is winning, they are just showing me what's possible, right? Of, of what could be, you know, if I'm willing to, you know, put in like the reps and sets to do it. And, and that's, that's all that is. So I, so I really, it really resonates with me because like you said, it, it goes back to that idea of creating, right? When, like when someone else is winning, celebrate that. Like that's where it is. And, and for me, that simple idea has, has been so healing and transformative for me because it realized, like, like you said, like life, you can truly be limitless. You just have to sort of be open to the idea. Right. Yeah, uh, and you know, you you had to, you have to focus in on what you can control. Yeah, and, you know, what, while you were talking there, I was just thinking, like in the off season, I you know I follow Kwaku Botanga for yeah. for a player and Chris Aki, yeah. but they're all training with other athletes from other teams. Yeah, right. You know why? Because that makes them better. Yeah. You know, some day, some days, I'm sure Chris out, out lifts, uh, you know, Kevin Mwamba when they're working out, <laughs> and and Kevin will outdo him in some of the agility drills or whatnot. But that just enhances and and helps with that sort of thing. You know, uh, you know, here I've been trying to talk with a few of the two swim clubs in town because they're two separate, and I say, you know, realistically, you should join so that the best person from this club and this clubs should be side by each because at the end of the day it's it's a time <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh and so yeah the, you'll you'll have a placing but if you focus in on what your best time will be you're, you're in there so um you know a, a win could be eighth place at offsa but that young woman might have hit her personal best by two seconds. Mm -hmm. So what's the definition of win? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what you share is a great reminder that it, it's your definition of winning, right? Like, again, if you are, you know, becoming better than you were yesterday, that's the only thing, you know, that's kind of the measuring stick, right? And, and I think from there, it just allows you to live in the gain 
as opposed to comparing your standards, your results, your self-worth to someone else's definition, right? So I, I think it's a simple and powerful reminder. And, and it's very difficult in this era where you have yep. influencers on Instagram mm -hmm. and you're showing your best, um, you know, yeah. posts all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there is a lot of comparisons yep. uh, uh, that social media sort of creates. And it goes back to, again, I don't want to bring back uh, stoic philosophy too much here, but, you know, Epictetus just said, uh, you, you have to, you can only control what you can control. All others are indifference, you know, are indifferences. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if, if somebody wins a race or so forth, you have to just look at your performance and, you know, uh, uh see where you can improve mm -hmm. see what you did well because it, it like i said it could have been a personal best at two seconds mm -hmm. and you were eighth place yeah. but you know you take that measurement and yeah you can park it but don't make that the focus make yeah. the focuses on on what you can can uh, do better mm -hmm. or uh, what win that you had in that performance. Hmm. It's funny, the more we chat, the more I realize like these simple ideas have been around since, you know, the beginning of time, right? Like these are, these aren't new ideas. It's just, like you said, the discipline of mind to practice them and understanding it won't be, you know, sort of like embracing, uh, I guess, releasing the illusion of perfection and embracing imperfection, right? Is where, I don't know. I, I I find that simple idea just reminds me that life's a game, right? Like have yeah. fun. No, just, a lot of this is 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 <laughs> wisdom from twenty five hundred years ago. You know, yeah. uh, in uh, in Athens or Rome or uh, uh, a lot of a lot of different philosophers. Um, you know, uh, had applied it, and and it was really funny. Uh, when I took that philosophy course at Western, the only reason I took it was I lost a, an arm wrestle to Andrew <laughs> Schneider, uh, and I had to take it because yeah. she she was a philosophy phys ed major, I was a sport management, and I said I really didn't need the credit, but uh, I lost it and I had to own up. She and she beat me fair and square. Mm -hmm. She's an Olympic athlete. <laughs> It just reminds me sometimes that the best opportunities to learn, to grow and evolve sometimes, you know, come disguised, right? As things that we didn't really think and it just happened, you know. Well, to... you know what? I, I think when you're young too, you don't have the perspective of, of experience 10 years out. Yeah. Like I'm looking back now, 30, 40 years uh, yeah. of that. And you have a different type of perspective, but yeah. Uh, you know, if I, if I would have paid attention yeah. when I was in my twenties yeah. to that mind body connection, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would have helped in, in whatever way it could have helped yeah. at that time. Yeah. Uh, I don't have regrets about that. You know, things, mm -hmm. things sort of, uh, evolved, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you go your own path, but, um, uh, you know, there's always lessons to learn from reflection I, I love that and why i love that just on a side note is you know one of the first things i do every morning is i write out 10 things i feel grateful for i call it today's blessings that's just the activity and one of the things i always often come back to is this idea like is i'm so grateful for every experience because it shaped me into who i am and i find that again it's getting away from this good or bad it's just hey it's happened it's made you who you are celebrate that so I, I really yeah. love everything you're sharing. Yeah, I think writing first thing in the morning is really good. I, 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 um, I'm a bit of a disciple of uh, Julia Cameron, who, who did the artist way and morning papers. And yeah. basically all I do is I don't know what I'm going to write. Yeah. And I don't share it with anybody. I don't share it with my wife or anything. I mm -hmm. just write. And I have my pen to paper, mm -hmm. three pages, and whatever comes to mind. And it's basically a mind dump. And it actually is very uh, freeing. It helps me set my day. Yeah. Love it. Love it.
So I'm curious, I want to be respectful of your time, Peter. You know, obviously, like I said, you, you've had this, this beautiful journey in sport, right? That's taking you to many amazing places. You know, you've obviously had an impact and served so many people. You know, what is a piece of advice you would have for someone maybe that's starting on their journey? You know, like what, what is that one piece of advice you would offer them? Well, first of all, um, you know, I think what's really important is that, um, especially here at, at Laurier, we have like great career services and so forth. And they have all kinds of assessments, you know, career assessments, communication styles, and so forth. And I learned very early that you have to know about yourself and be very self aware of what your strengths and, and weaknesses are. And it's okay to have weaknesses. It's, it's really okay to have weaknesses. And I can say that I had real trouble giving up certain things that I wasn't very good at, even as an early in my time as an athletic director, not realizing that you, if, you, if you surround yourself with people of those skills, they wanna help you, Yeah. right? And they augment that. And you, then you focus in on your strengths. Mm -hmm. Even going into an interview, you're much comfortable, more comfortable articulating your strengths. When they ask you a question about other side, you can learn something about it, but you're not gonna be comfortable. And you know what? Again, it comes back to the body. The body will, will give it away in the interview on that side. So um, when, you, when you focus in on your strengths, your behaviors become even better. And you can always be better at your strengths. Always, always be better at your strengths. So take those advantages of, of even a, a, if people are listening from high school, go to your high school counselor and do a, a, you know, a career assessment test of what types of career. You don't have to choose your career in high school, but what types? Mine said a police officer, a social worker, yeah. even said a preacher. Yeah. I did an assessment before I took the Laurier job to find out, do I have the skill sets to be a CIAU or U sports uh, athletic director? Is Scott McFadden, who was a sports psychologist of the Dallas Stars, did it for me. And he said, yeah, you've got the skill sets, but you know, you have these areas that if you're the, you're the person you've got to surround yourself with people that yes, are smarter than you and let go of that ego. It's okay to be surrounded by smart people, you know, that are smarter than you. It's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. They, they only enhance the department, the collective, what you're doing. Yeah. So if, if you're young, make sure you're very self-aware of what you want to do. The second piece I'd say is, find a mentor. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't want to phone so-and-so in that or send an email or an introduction or show up on there and distinguish yourself. Uh, you know, um, you know, there was, um, uh, one of my students, um, you know, she, she's now actually the, uh, with the Atlanta Falcons as the manager of football administration there, Kristen uh, uh, Grohls. She was manager for Gary Jeffries here. And, you know, she I helped her, uh, Scott M Mitchell got her an internship at uh, the Tiger Cats. She did, did her, her master's at Ohio U. After Ohio U, she sent out a resume to every general manager of any every NFL football club with a $5 Starbucks card. And the start of her letter said, while you're enjoying your Starbucks coffee, if you'd see and put all her strengths and, and highlights. Yeah. Now, she got two interviews and she got her first job with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And that started her career. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to reach out. Fear, 90% of the time, will never happen. Whatever you worry about, whatever you are concerned about, 90% will not happen. 
And even the 10%, if something happens, what's the worst that can happen? You know, you write it down, different things. And you know what? Your anxiety goes down as soon as you write out the consequences that may or may not happen. Go ahead, do that, that little piece. But Christian Grohls now is, she's, she's up there uh, in the administration with the Atlanta Falcons right now, just because she had uh, the initiative to send out a $5 Starbucks card to yeah. every manager in the NFL. I love that reminder, Peter. Again, the simplicity, right? Like really get to know yourself. And, you know, as cliche as that is, it's just gaining a greater awareness. And when you gain a greater awareness of yourself, you can actually create a clearer path moving forward. That's so right. Simple. Don't be afraid to ask people to where you have to get better and ask it that way. Where can I get better? Hmm. You know, don't, don't say what, what your faults are. Where can I get better? You're going to find out the feedback on there. Nobody likes hearing what they're bad at, yeah. but if you switch the question to how, how can you get better? Mm -hmm. You'll get that feedback, but they'll also give you suggestions or solutions mm -hmm. in their own experience that they had. And you either take them or not, it may not fit with what you want to do, but yeah. uh, at least you learn from the wisdom of, of somebody uh, uh, that has gone through something of, of that nature. So, you know, the question, how can I get better is a lot better is, where do I suck at? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely more empowering. So Peter, I really want to take a moment to acknowledge you. I want to take a moment just to acknowledge you for the man you are, right? The great husband, the great dad, the great teacher, coach, mentor, leader, but most importantly, the amazing human being you are. You know, the one thing I've really gained from this conversation is just how it's just the intention with which you, you approach life, right? And, and for you, I can tell that, you know, this comes back to what you first shared, like invest in people. Like I can feel that energy. I can see it. Like you're, you're, you're investing into me, right? You're investing in with our audience and you're sharing your wisdom, your lived experience and really just re truly want to help and serve. So thank you for providing me with that reminder. Thank you for being the change. And, and just thank you again for being an amazing human being. Thank you very much, Jason. And I, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, this show uh, certainly goes out to a lot of young people that will learn from the wisdom of a lot of your guests that are on there. And I wish you continued success on your podcast. Thank you very much. So folks, here's what I want to remind you. Peter shared so many valuable nuggets of wisdom that will not only help you succeed as an athlete, but in the game of life. But what I want to remind you is that knowledge is potential power. It's the consistent and focused application of that great knowledge that actually creates great results. So take one of these valuable nuggets of wisdom and go apply it to your life today. And as I often remind you in the huddle, you are deserving of greatness. You are worthy of greatness. You are greatness. And my ask for you is, if this resonates with you, go share this conversation with someone. And that is the easiest way to, to share these simple ideas and to go be a blessing for someone else. So I look forward to chatting with you next time in the huddle. Have a blessed rest of your day.